In the shadow of the pyramids near Cairo, Egypt, in the heart of the Muslim world, the leaders of China, Great Britain, and the United States meet face to face for the first time. President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, united in the war against the Empire of Japan. Madam Chiang Kai-shek is here as advisor and interpreter to her husband. commands of the United Nations powers mapping the blows that will strip Japan of the vast empire gained through 50 years of terror and aggression. Three great allies pledged to a common cause, the unconditional surrender of Japan. To Tehran, capital of Iran, the conference is moved. Here, 6,000 miles from Washington, 2,700 miles from London, and 1,500 miles from Moscow, the President and Prime Minister meet their great ally in the war against Nazi Germany, Marshal Joseph Stalin, Premier of Soviet Russia. The dramatic conference for which the world has watched and waited, Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill, climaxing a series of meetings that began with the Atlantic Charter and carried on through Casablanca and Moscow. Diplomatic representatives of the three nations are present. Molotov, Eden, Perriman. Mr. Churchill's daughter, Sarah, an officer in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, is introduced to Premier Stalin by President Roosevelt. A dramatic ceremony highlights the meeting, the presentation of the Sword of Stalingrad, gift of Britain's king to the people of that heroic city. Marshal Stalin accepts the tribute on behalf of the Russian people. Backed by the greatest concentration of military power in history, the Tehran Conference broadcasts its official communique to the world. We, the President of the United States of America, the Prime Minister of Great Britain and the Premier of the Soviet Union have met and expressed our determination that our nation shall work together in the war and in the peace that will follow. The common understanding which we have here reached guarantees that victory will be ours. We came here with hope and determination. We leave here friends in fact, in spirit, and in purpose. Within the past year, within the past few weeks, history has been made. And it is far better history for the whole human race than any that we've known or even dared to hope for in these tragic times through which we pass. A great beginning was made in the Moscow conference last October by Mr. Molotov, Mr. Eden, and our own Mr. Howe. There and then the way was paved for the later meetings. At Cairo and Tehran, we devoted ourselves not only to military matters, 
We devoted ourselves also to consideration of the future, to plans for the kind of world which alone can justify all the sacrifices of this war. At Cairo, Prime Minister Churchill and I spent four days with the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek. It is the first time that we'd had an opportunity to go over the complex situation in the Far East with him personally. We were able not only to settle upon definite military strategy, but also to discuss certain long-range principles which we believe can assure peace in the Far East for many generations to come. Those principles are as simple as they are fundamental. They involve the restoration of stolen property to its rightful owner, and the recognition of the rights of millions of people in the Far East to build up their own forms of self-government without molestation. Essential to all peace and security in the Pacific and in the rest of the world is the permanent elimination of the Empire of Japan as a potential force of aggression. Never again must our soldiers and sailors and marines and other soldiers and sailors and marines be compelled to fight from island to island as they are fighting so gallantly and so successfully today. Increasingly powerful forces are now hammering at the Japanese at many points over an enormous arc which curves down through the Pacific from the Aleutians to the jungles of Burma. Our own army and navy, our air forces, the Australians and New Zealanders, the Dutch and the British land, air and sea forces are all forming a band of steel which is slowly but surely closing in on Japan. And on the mainland of Asia, under the Generalissimo's leadership, the Chinese ground and air forces, augmented by American air forces, are playing a vital part in starting the drive which will push the invaders into the sea. Following out the military decisions at Cairo, General Marshall has just flown around the world and has had conferences with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, conferences which will spell plenty of bad news for the Japs in the not too far distant future. After the Cairo conference, Mr. Churchill and I went by airplane to Tehran. There, we met with Marshal Stalin. We talked with complete frankness on every conceivable subject connected with the winning of the war and the establishment of a durable peace after the war. Within three days of intense and consistently amicable discussions, we agreed on every point concerned with the launching of a gigantic attack upon Germany. The Russian army will continue its stern offensive on Germany's Eastern Front. The Allied armies in Italy and Africa will bring relentless pressure on Germany from the south. And now the encirclement will be complete as great American and British forces attack from other points of the compass. The commander selected to lead the combined attack from these other points is General Dwight D. Eisenhower. His performances in Africa, in Sicily, and in Italy have been brilliant. He knows by practical, successful experience the way to coordinate air, sea, and land power. All of these will be under his control. Lieutenant General Carl Spots will command the entire American strategic bombing force operating against Germany.
During the last two days in Tehran, Marshal Stalin, Mr. Churchill and I looked ahead, ahead to the days and months and years that will follow Germany's defeat. We were united in determination that Germany must be stripped of her military might and be given no opportunity within the foreseeable future to regain that might. The United Nations have no intention to enslave the German people. We wish them to have a normal chance to develop in peace as useful and respectable members of the European family. But we most certainly emphasize that word respectable. For we intend to rid them once and for all of Nazism and Prussian militarism and the fantastic and disastrous notion that they constitute the master race. In these conferences, we were concerned with basic principles, principles which involve the security and the welfare and the standard of living of human beings in countries large and small. To use an American and somewhat ungrammatical colloquialism, I may say that I got along fine with Marshal Stalin. He is a man who combines a tremendous, relentless determination with a stalwart good humor. I believe he is truly representative of the heart and soul of Russia. And I believe that we are going to get along very well with him and the Russian people. Very well indeed. Britain, Russia, China, and the United States and their allies represent more than three quarters of the total population of the Earth. As long as these four nations, with great military power, stick together in determination to keep the peace, there will be no possibility of an aggressor nation arising to start another world war.